Well, I had a totally different message that I was planning to speak this Sunday. And then once this moment happened this past week, I was like, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem like the right thing. So then I started pressing into God and um, I just feel like I'm supposed to share with you guys kind of the process that I've had over the past two weeks of really leaning into God with this whole miracle that we needed. Um, and then to dive a little bit deeper. So let me pray and then and then we'll get going. Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to share today. Holy Spirit, I just give you my words. I ask you to speak through me and I just surrender to you and we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We thank you that you are already here and we just ask for your wisdom today. Holy Spirit, I ask you to speak through me every single thing that people need here today and that anything that people don't need, that it would not come out of my mouth. And we just thank you for this time in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So we are in a very weighty moment here at Family Life right now. Um, It's been 17 years, like Danny said, of not having our own home. We were actually kicked out of our original first home that we did have. And so it is like a longing fulfilled (laughs) that the, the place that we're in now as a church And, you know, the past two weeks when we would see these different needs come in, these different things for the building of like, oh, this, this building actually won't happen unless this, unless this happens. Um, Danny and I were in South Carolina on a family trip and I kept having these questions in my mind of like, is this actually going to happen? Like, are we actually going to be able to cross this finish line or are we just going to, Danny kept being like, well, well, if it doesn't happen, then we're going to, you know, then at least we've raised this much money and we can start again. And, you know, I believe it's going to happen, but, and the thing that I kept feeling over and over and over and over and over again, is I just kept kept hearing the phrases, the phrase of the song, um, you've never failed me yet. And I just kept that in my mind over and over and over. And I was like, God, you haven't failed us yet. And I'm trusting that you're not going to fail us as we move forward. I'm trusting that you're not going to take us to five inches before the finish line and be like, peace out. Bye. Like, good luck. Have fun. And I kept, every time I would lean in to hear God's voice about God, what are you actually saying about this? I just kept hearing him say, I've got this. And to actually believe that, to actually internalize that, to actually attach my faith to that, it took a lot of trust. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about trust. I want to to talk about our relationship with God, because if you know me, you can't, you know that you cannot hear a message from me and it not be tied into relationships somehow. Um, But today I want to talk specifically about our relationship with God and the element of trust in relationship. Um, so I'm going to start in James one, two through eight, just because I felt like I was supposed to read this, read this over you guys and just show you what we've been through the past two weeks. Um, it says my fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith, or I would say attach that, your trust, when you know your faith or your trust is tested, it stirs up in you the power of endurance. And then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection or wholeness into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. And if anyone longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom and he will give it. He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you over your failures, but he will overwhelm your failures with his generous grace. Just make sure you ask, empowered by confident faith, without doubting that you will receive. For the ambivalent, which means having contradictory opinions about someone, for the ambivalent person believes one minute and doubts the next. Being undecided makes you become like the rough seas driven and tossed by the wind. You're up one minute and tossed down the next. When you are half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the Lord when you're in that condition? Wow. Wow. Like that talk, that speaks so much to be to me about my trust in God. That if my trust is wavering at all, how can I expect to be able to receive anything from God 
if the trust isn't there, that he'll actually, that he actually is who he says that he is. Do I trust God in the good times? Do I trust, do I only trust him in the good times? Do I only trust him with low risk items? And I want to challenge us today to go so much deeper in the area of trust with God, because the reality is to have great faith, you have to have great relationship. And to have great relationship, you have to have trust. Henry Cloud says, he's an amazing author and speaker, he says that if trust is broken in a relationship, it becomes literally the number one item. It becomes the only thing to fix. Because if you lose trust, you lose relationship. And so the, one of the biggest things that I want to talk about today is not just how to trust God but how many people in this room feels like God, bro- God has broken our trust? Ooh, that doesn't sound very holy. God doesn't break trust. No, he doesn't. But our perception tells us he does. So how many times do we get offended with God because he doesn't do what we think he should do in the time we think he should do it, in the way we think he should do it, and then our trust in him gets knocked down a notch because we said, mm, I am thinking you really didn't have my best interest in mind here, God. So maybe next time I'm in this area, I'm not going to, I'm just going to handle it. Because I probably can do better than you can do in this scenario. So we actually begin to have these filters over our eyes of how we see God. So somebody in this room could say, hey, I believe that God is, you know, somebody in this room maybe has experienced Um, miraculous healing in their body. So you cannot convince that person that God doesn't want to heal because they've experienced it, right? But what if that person has had like severe financial difficulties? Can you maybe try and convince them that God maybe doesn't want to fully provide for them? Because, well, certain things have happened and maybe that means that like, maybe that means these certain things about God. Because to have trust, you have to have experiences to back up that trust. You have to have experiences to back up the trust in the person you're in a relationship with. So you cannot tell me that Nancy Barlow doesn't like people. (laughs) Right? Because if you experience her, or Tiffany, like you can experience them for like 30 seconds and you've had enough experience with that person to know for without a shadow of a, a shadow of a doubt that Nancy Barlow likes people, right? Now, if you don't have those experiences, you can get around other people who know her and go, "Hey, is that true about her?" And they could go, "Yeah, that's true." But until you experience it for yourself, or maybe what if somebody had a bad experience with her and you talk to the wrong person? And they say, "Well, Maybe, like that's what other people says, but that is not what I've experienced. And then if you hear it from the wrong source, then your perspective becomes jaded and then you actually could have a lack of trust in her before you ever even talk to her. So to address the concept of offense with God really sounds like not super churchy. It sounds not super holy because I think anytime that we feel disappointed by God, we just stuff it because we shouldn't be feeling that way. And we try to convince ourselves, well, I'll just stuff it. Well, you know, once you stuff too many things, it explodes at some point. And a lot of the people in, in, it's been a, you know, hard thing to see, but a lot of people in my generation that I've seen that I grew up walking with God with, they had a lot of riding on other people's experiences with their faith, but they didn't have a lot of their own experience of God. And so then when when it was tested, it just completely fell apart and they're deconstructing their faith now because they don't know what to make of it because they've had all of these, they're ambivalent. They've had all of these differing experiences that make them go, well, maybe God's trustworthy, maybe he's not. Well, maybe God wants to provide, maybe he's not. Well, maybe God wants to heal, maybe he doesn't. So to have trust, it's important to know the truth about the person, both through getting to know them 
personally and talking to them and through having experiences where that trust is reinforced. And so with God, it's, I'm like not even in my notes, I'm just talking. Um, <laughs> um, with, <laughs> now that just took me off course. Um, it's really interesting. Put it down. I'm going to be one of those really cool people that only wear one earring. Yeah. There, you go. there we go. Sorry, guys. My fashion took precedence over function. <laughs> So I just had to switch back. Um, So trust is the foundation upon which a relationship can be built. To trust a person, you need to know their character for yourself, not just from what somebody says, but from your personal experiences. And the more positive experiences you have with somebody, the easier it is to trust them. So how do you learn if somebody is trustworthy? You trust them. Oh, interesting. Because if you don't trust them, you will never know if they're trustworthy. So my question today is, what have you not trusted God with yet? What are you still holding in, my, in your hand going, ah, I don't know if you're trustworthy. I don't know if you can actually handle this. You cannot convince me after these past two weeks that God doesn't want to provide for family life. You can't. I'm sorry, even though I have worked for the church for 10 years and I have seen days where we couldn't make payroll and then a check come in or just struggle after struggle after struggle. And I have seen so many miracles. I shouldn't have had the question two weeks ago, is, this, is God actually going to provide? But I did because I'm human. So then it was a battle of, I have to remind myself of the truth of who God is. And I have to remind myself of his track record. And his track record is he hasn't failed us yet here at Family Life. And so then when we started seeing gift after gift after gift after gift pour in and 5,000 and 6,000 and 5,000 and 20,000 and all of these different things pour in from people, it was just further reaffirmation and reconfirmation that God is actually who he says he is. Now, that doesn't mean that some people here in this building, like we as a a unified church here can all agree, yes, God wants to provide for family life, but what does that mean for you individually? Do you actually believe that God wants to provide for you individually? Because maybe you've had some experiences that have told you otherwise and that you've judged God for. It's interesting that when you look into the scriptures about trust, if you Google verses about trust in the Bible, it actually primarily brings up verses about God's character. That's very interesting. So I looked up trust. I looked up verses about trust in God, and it brings up Jeremiah 29, 11. That's weird. The, verse tr- the word trust isn't even in Jeremiah 29, 11. But it's for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. It's telling me about God's character. Hmm. Next verse down, John 10, 10. Thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I've come, and, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. There's no trust word in there, but it's more about God's character. Uh, Philippians 4.19 says, My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. No word about trust in there. It's God's character. So if we're having issues with trust in God, we may need to go back to knowing who his character is and who he truly is. Because our mind and our perception will tell us a whole lot of things that God is not. But if we go back to who he is and actually sit with that truth, it can start to take the place of those lies. Um, In Colossians 3, let me open this up. Colossians 3, 13. um, It says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any one of you has a a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, there's many other verses in the Bible about forgiveness and it says, you know, if, if your brother has sinned against you, forgive, blah, 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 blah. This one, this verse is very interesting 
because it says forgive if you have a grievance against someone. Meaning they may not have actually sinned against you. You might just be offended. Your perception might be off. That whole situation may not have actually happened. Yet you're still instructed to forgive. Interesting. So what that tells me is there may be some times that I need to forgive God. Do not believe, do not, some of you might have thought right after I said that, that I'm telling you that God does bad things or that God sins. That is not what I'm saying. God is perfect and everything he does is good all the time. Our perception can tell us otherwise, which causes us to be offended towards God, which then makes us need to forgive God. That's why we need to forgive God as much, if not more, as we need to forgive our fellow believers and ourselves. So what are you offended with God by? What are you offended with God about? What are the things that your trust in him has dropped lower because of the experiences that you've had? Because when trust is broken, we clam up and we take a step back from relationship when trust is broken because we're scared to show that part of us again. So how does that affect our relationship with God? If we don't feel, if we're offended and we don't feel like we can trust him, how are we supposed to have an open heart relationship with God? Because if you take this into your actual day-to-day relationships and think about it that way, if somebody has broken your trust, do you want to spend much time around them? No. Do you want to talk to them very much? No. Do you want to go give them parts of your heart? Absolutely not. So if you have offense with God and there's trust issues going on, the very first thing to do is to step back into relationship. The very first thing to do is to step back into communication. If you can't hear his voice in certain areas, I would question if there's maybe an offense in the way. You may think he's being silent. He may think you're offended. Did you hear that? You may think he's silent, but you might just be offended because you don't actually want to hear what he has to say because you don't trust what he would actually say. So we need to get back to clear, open-hearted relationship with Jesus, and that comes through forgiveness. That comes through the removal of offense. And when you, when you actually forgive, like real forgiveness, you start with a clean slate again. So you get rid of the record of wrongs, right? You actually have to throw that away. That doesn't doesn't get to be a part of the relationship anymore. Amen? Um, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight all of your paths. So how many of us here can confidently say that we trust the Lord with all of our heart, not leaning on any of our own understanding? Ooh, that hurts. Because I think I'm smart sometimes. And like, I, I got this. I know how to do this. But am I willing to sacrifice that and give that over to God and be like, I actually do believe that you know better than me in this area. Even if I'm a genius in this area, you still know better than me. So you're still worthy of my trust in this area. Psalms uh, 118.8 says, It is better to take refuge in in the Lord than to trust in humans. Ooh, that's good. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's interesting that that's a verse that came up when I studied trust. It's telling me about God's character that he never changes. So that means that if God provided money for family life to get to where we need to go, then he for sure is going to provide what I need to get to where I need to go. Amen. So, um, Henry Cloud, more Henry Cloud. He's so good. Um, All about, he has so much good stuff about trust. He says, people allow people they trust to have influence over their lives. So if our trust is fully in God, he actually begins to have that much more influence over our lives. 
So if we're, if we're called to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, then our relationship and our trust in God plays a massive factor in that because that's how the kingdom of heaven, that's how the influence of heaven to earth comes in. Um, and then, uh, okay, so when things do not go how we want them to go, how we expect them to go, when we get hurt, when, we, when things just don't go, don't go well, it is a very human thing to ask why. And I said this a couple weeks ago when we were talking about Benny Johnson's death, that a lot of people want to ask why when the reality is you need comfort. You don't need the answer, you need comfort. But when we feel like God has disappointed us in a certain area, it's very easy to ask why. And by definition, when we begin to jump into assuming that we know the why of a scenario or of the why of why somebody did something or didn't do something, that's actually called judgment. And I'm going to, this is what I was going to teach on today was judgment, um, which is super funny coming from the book, How to Stop the Pain that we've been going through as leadership. Uh, but I felt like it was important to talk about trust first. But our trust can be broken because of judgment when we assume the why. So we could actually de declare somebody totally guilty of something and they've never even done something wrong. They've never done a single thing wrong, but in our minds, they're 100% guilty. That's judgment. So how do you cure that? Well, first of all, it's really good to just like go talk to the person and clear, clear the air. Really good, really good thing. The next thing is to step into, you can observe, okay, I could not pay my bill on time. That's the observation. The judgment of that is I could not pay my bill, my bill on time, therefore God does not want to provide for me. See that? There's an observation and then there's a judgment. The judgment is what brings me pain. The reality of the bill not being paid on time is just an observation. That's just a fact. That in and of itself does not have the power to cause me pain. But when I say God doesn't want to provide for me, oh, that can cause me pain. So it's important to not step into judging God. We are not given the right to judge God. We are not given the right to know why God does the things that he does or doesn't do the things that he doesn't do. You have no idea what's going on behind the picture, behind the scenes. Our son, Will, he wants to destroy and get into everything he possibly can right now. And if you tell him no... He will f sprawl flat out on his face and weep <laughs> like you are the worst person that could ever exist on the human face of the earth because you told him no. Now, what's the reality? Now, Will probably judged us saying no and was like, you don't love me with his a year and a half old brain. And he's like, you don't love me and you don't want me to have the thing that I want to have that's on the other side of that glass that I want to break. And the reality is that from our perspective, we see I'm keeping you safe. Everything that I'm doing is out of love. Everything that I'm doing is for your benefit, yet you're angry at me. So think about that from God's perspective. How much do we not know of what's going on behind the scenes that we're like, why aren't you doing this, God? And he's like, do you see what I'm, hello? Like I'm saving you from so much that you have no idea about, but because you don't see it from my perspective, you're judging me and making me the bad guy. So when we restore trust in God, we can actually begin to see his perception again. But when we're in judgment towards God, we can, it's very hard to see things from his perspective. It's very hard to see things from his point of view. Um, James Richard says, Many times we lose trust in people not because they are untrustworthy, but because our judgment of them destroys the trust. Um, so... The health of your relationship with God is at stake if you're not dealing with your pain with God. The health of your relationship with God is at stake if you're not dealing with your pain with God. 
because it needs to be dealt with. So if it's been stuffed because you think you're being extra holy by not being offended with God, nobody wins there. You don't win and God doesn't win and you, the, your relationship with God does not win. So it's important to, I, I'd want to challenge everybody today, get that crap up, sorry, but like get it up. It has to come up and it has to get out. So if you got to get angry with God, go home or go in your car and get angry with him. He's a big boy. He can handle it. God does not get offended by your offense with him. He doesn't. He already knows it. You're the only one lying to yourself thinking that he doesn't know that you're offended with him. So go. And if you need to, I'm giving you permission as a senior leader here at Family Life, go in your car and get out what you need to get out whatever those words may be, whatever needs to be said, whatever needs to get out, he can handle it. And he wants to love you in the midst of feeling that way. Because this is interesting. You cannot feel fully loved by God if you don't feel fully known by him. And you can't be fully known by him if you're hiding your offenses from him. So if you actually let him into these parts of your heart that you're really ashamed that you're mad at him about, You could feel a greater love from God than you've ever felt in your entire life by allowing him into that part of your heart. But it takes courage. And it takes a willingness to get messy because it gets messy. Because you don't realize the depth of things that you're mad at God about. I, I could go and I could spend time with God and realize all of this yucky stuff come up that I didn't even realize was there because I'm just pushing it down because I don't think I should feel that way. But if I actually not only allow myself to feel those things, but let God love me in the midst of feeling those things and love myself in the midst of feeling those things, my entire relationship with God could transform. I could begin to hear him clearly. I can begin to experience the peace that passes all understanding. I can begin to experience hope for my future. And maybe, just maybe, that's the key to my breakthrough. Maybe it's my offense with God that's actually keeping some of the breakthroughs in my life from coming. That's very, yeah, because there's no trust. Full circle. Um. So when you have trust, you can experience confidence. You can experience hope. You can experience peace. Anxiety can be completely removed. I truly believe that anxiety is a result of a lack of trust or misplaced trust. So anxiety can be removed when trust is in place. Vulnerability can return. Open heart communication can return. And true, you can begin to experience what true relationship with God is actually like. So my question to you today is what can you place in God's hands that you haven't yet? The only way that you can know if you can trust him is to trust him. And if you don't trust God in certain areas, there may be a fence that needs to be addressed. So I would actually just recommend to you, just in your, in your heart, in your mind, go through the big areas, finances, relationship, career, future, um, emotional health, mental health, all of these different areas. And I would love in your mind to just kind of rate yourself of like, where's my trust in God in this area? And if it's anything less than a 10, You either need to grow deeper in your relationship with him or you need to address some offense. And all of those areas, God's desire is for those areas to be brought up to 10 (laughs) so that there is full confidence and full trust. And one of the things, um, for those of you who don't know, because I'm not currently doing it, I am certified in rapid rapid mind renewal sessions, which is just emotional healing sessions. And one of the most beautiful things that has happened in some of the sessions that I've done with people is that when we've dealt with offense with God and they're walking through forgiving God, a lot of times we ask Jesus to show up in their memories. And what happens is that it's like people get to go through their whole past life, 
the, the, the whole life that they've lived so far. And like a movie, Jesus begins to show up in each memory where they ask God, where were you? What happened here? The scene, why did I get abused? Why did, why did, why did, why wasn't I able to, you know, make ends meet here? Why couldn't I provide for my kids? Why did this person betray me? Why did these different things happen where you stepped into judgment and Jesus shows up and brings healing and you begin to rewrite your history with Jesus, with truth involved, with his perspective involved. And then you're able to start from a place of trust going forward with Jesus, rather than having all of these items in your past that tell you otherwise about God's trustworthiness. Does that make sense? So I believe that God wants to do that in your life with him. He wants to rewrite the history that he has with you that may not be good. And he wants to be able to go forward with you knowing his character, with you knowing without a shadow of a doubt who he is. That you can be the person that other people go to. You know, a a huge part of trust is just confidence in the person. And when you you get married to somebody, um, there's a reason that you do it in front of witnesses. There's a reason that you do it with people surrounding you. It's so that when you go through hard times, those people can remind you of the covenant that you made. It's so that those people can hold you. So, so when you're having issues with trusting God, get around people <laughs> who are going to push you towards your relationship with Jesus, who are going to push you towards the truth of who he is, who are going to push you towards he is trustworthy. And even though your experiences may say otherwise, he is good and he does have the best for you. And hey, maybe go deal with that offense with God. So you can get back at the table and have clear relationship with him again. So I would love um, if the service host can pass out. We ha- we're going to be doing communion today. And I purposefully kept it for the end of the service because I feel like it's a beautiful time to release offense with God. And to get back into a place where we can fully trust him to get back into a place where we say, God, no matter what's happened in the past, I'm going to give you a clean slate from here on out. And I'm going to actually put my trust back in you again in this area that I've been carrying, that I've been holding away from you. Um, So how do you rebuild trust. You know, we can get rid of the offenses from the past, but to rebuild trust, first it starts out with forgiveness. Then it starts out with a clean slate. Then from there, it's important to keep a check on our perception and know that our feelings don't tell us truth. So it's important to know God's perspective on things. Remember that you don't know it all. Don't let your feelings define truth. Based some people have some people have the mindset that based on how today goes will determine whether God is good or not. That's an ambivalent person being tossed tossed by the waves. Don't be that way. Remember that you don't know it all, you don't see it all. And then I got this phrase that I think might be for somebody in this room. But I think it'd be a really good idea to start keeping a record of rights. that you get to go back to when you need it. Keep a record of rights. Go back to reminding yourself who God is. I want to write down, Danny and I have talked about the different things that we're dreaming up to have in the, in the new building that are just monuments saying, look what God did here and look what God did here and look what God did here. And that you can't walk through the building without being reminded about some part of God's character and what he's done in the people at family life because that's who he is and we all need daily reminders of it. So when Jesus died, he died for you so that you could know him, so that you could have clear communication with him, so that your slate could be wiped clean, so that you could be one with him, completely inseparable no matter what. How beautiful is that, that when we get offended with God, he never separates from us ever 
Communion is for you to remember what he's given you, but also it's for you to remember what you've given him. You gave him your heart. You decided it. You're not a victim of relationship with God if you're in this room. Hopefully not. You chose it. You chose relationship with God. You chose to give him your trust. You chose to give him your heart. And if you ever begin to feel otherwise about that, step back into the truth. You chose it. And you chose to give him that. So remember what you've chosen to give him. So Holy Spirit, right now, I just ask you to show people in this room if there's any part of our hearts that are shut down to you, that are offended with you, whether it's memories, whether it's past pain, whether it's current issues. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to make it so clear to us what those things are. And for some people, it might be overwhelming. It might be like there's so much, I I don't even know where to start. Well, today's a good starting place. And I just want everybody to say this. Just say, as an act of my will, I choose to forgive you, God, for every offense that I've held in my heart against you. And I choose to forgive you for the ways that I thought you didn't measure up. And I choose to release you, God, from the offenses that I've held against you. And I let them go. I wipe the slate clean. And for those of you who need this, just say, um, and God, I ask you to forgive me for holding a fence in my heart against you. I thank you that the slate is wiped clean. Let's open up communion and take the bread and just remember that (laughs) his body was broken for you so that you could be clean, so that your slate could be wiped completely clean. And just picture that as you take it. And I just want to say a reminder before we take the juice that communion really is not about the bread and the wine, the bread and the juice. It's about your heart. So you really could be in your car and have donut and coffee and do communion because it's reminding yourself of what God has done. If you don't have anything, you can have communion because communion is simply communication with God. (laughs) It's simply remembering. It's simply getting back to the place where we are aware, oh my goodness, God, this is what you did for me and you want relationship with me. So I'm gonna step back into our union. I'm gonna step back into our communication. And I want us to remember that Jesus' blood was shed for us. Not only to pay for our sins, but to pay for our healing, to pay for our provision, to pay for our relationships, to pay for our emotions, to pay for our mental health, to pay for every, every single one of those things. His blood was shed for that. So let's remember that as we take the juice. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask you to show every person here a truth about you. God, now that we've removed some offense, I ask you to show people, just even if it's one word, one picture, that you want them to have, that they know without a shadow of a doubt about you. 
going forward. Just one piece of truth. Holy Spirit, I ask you to show that to them right now. Father God, thank you so much for this message. Uh, thank you so much for the reminder of who you are, uh, not just in this unbelievable act of faithfulness that you have done for us, God. What a great time to remember that this is who you are. And any time in the past where you didn't do what we thought you were going to do, God, we forgive you. And what a, what a lightness that that brings. That, God, we don't have to be afraid of you. We don't have to withhold ourselves from you or close ourselves off. We don't have to protect ourselves from you. But we can be our full, true, authentic self before you. And you will meet us right there. That we can trust you. You are a rock upon which we can stand. We can put our faith in you. We can put our trust in you because you are good. You are faithful. You are a promise keeper. So God, we choose you today. Again, we choose you every day, but we choose you again today. You are the way. You are the truth and you are the light. We love you, God. We thank you for this body. We thank you for the season that you have us in. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for victory. And God, we just speak open roads and no obstructions mm -hmm. between here and closing on Thursday. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just pray that, God, you'll bring us sprinting through that finish line, singing your praises the whole way, bringing glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a great week, everybody.